Okay. All right. Welcome everybody to Outlining No Right Way. My name is Rachel Fiore. I'm one of the adult services librarians at Whittier Public Library. And I also have Jack Sanchez here, my co-host. She's the manager of the adult services. Hello. Um, and also I wanna thank you all for coming. And I also wanna thank the uh, Whittier Public Library Foundation for sponsoring this event. And tonight we have the author, Anne Louise Bannon. She has written several books, including her most recently published one uh, titled Death of the Chinese Field Hands, which is part of the Old Los Angeles series. Is that yes, right? it is. It's the third book in the series. Yeah. So and she's here to teach us about outlining. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Anne. OK. Okie dokie. Well, hey, thank you, everybody. I am thrilled to death to be here. I love the whole concept of talking about writing and the process of writing because there, are, it's an exciting thing to me, because, partly because I am a writer, but partly also because really it's about getting our voices out there. It's about telling our stories and everybody has a story to tell and 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 i want if if what i can do can help you get that story told we're good and so please feel free to ask lots and lots of questions um and you can put it in the chat uh raise your hand i think sometimes but jack and rachel will alert me what i'm going to do now is i'm going to share my screen because i actually have a powerpoint <laughs> and we're going to look at that and uh, let's see, there we are. All right, outlining no right way. Because there is no one right way to outline. Okay, so let's talk about that. What is an outline? An outline is a map. It's basically a tool to help get you from the beginning of the story to the end of the story. When, uh, you know, when you're writing, you want to know where you're going, or maybe you don't want to know where you're going, but it does help if you've got a map sometimes. Now, it can be a very loose map. It can be a very structured map, but it can help. Now, the type of map you're going to use is going to depend on your creative process. I can show you what I do exclusively, but that's not necessarily going to help you because... You may have a different style. You may have a different zeitgeist. I've gone to many, many writing classes where, you know, you've got master teachers and these are good best-selling authors and then you have to do it this way. Well, and then I leave feeling like there's something wrong with me because I'm not going to do it their way. It doesn't work for me. Now, I will sometimes learn from that. I had a teacher who said, you've got to use this particular process in the editing process. And I thought, yeah, right. I'm going to do that for every scene. Not happening. It is so not happening. But on the other hand, when I did get stuck on a scene, some of the tips she had did help me get past it. So there's always something you can do. And you can always learn. But don't feel like anything I say here is the last word on how to do anything. All right. It's how you learn yourself and how you get involved and what works for you. Um, I've also learned some of these things native, natively. So I, you know, hey, this is the way you do it. Well, yeah, I've been doing that for years, big deal. Oh, is that what you call it? So the other part of it is I could teach you all the tools in the world, but it's not gonna work unless you know which is gonna be the right tool for you, which is basically my next point, your creative process. Your creative process is going to be unique to you, Angelina. It's going to be unique to you, Maria. It's going to be unique to you, Henry. Each one of you is going to have a different creative process. And it's usually going to be on a spectrum between two extremes. The important thing to remember is that no one process is better than any other. You want to think about these things consciously because it does help you get your story down on paper or onto the screen, however you want to call it. But it also helps you think about how you want to structure it. So if you know that you tend to be very audially oriented, I happen to be an audio writer and I know I have to hear the scene before I can write it, then I don't stress if the things aren't actually getting typed in if I've gone over the scene about three or four times. On the other hand, 
if I have to have a very organized, or, you know, if I'm one of those people who has to be very organized and things start coming together, then I need to make sure that I got things laid out in a certain way. Doesn't mean my process is better than anyone else's. And doesn't mean your process is better than anyone else's. It's just yours. Now, let's figure out how many of you have got paper and pen with you? Uh, yeah, I can see that. Henry, are you got one? All right. It'll be pretty easy to figure out which side of the ledger you are on this quiz. But if you want to draw a line down the center of your paper and put an X mark on the left if you agree with the left hand statement, an X mark on the right if you agree with the right hand statement. So we're going to start. When you're on vacation, do you organize everything to the nth degree, know exactly where you're going, how you're going to get there, what time you'll arrive, and what you're going to do when you get there? Or do you kind of wander aimlessly around, checking everything as you find it, maybe checking a mouth map to figure out how to get home, okay? When you're cooking a weeknight dinner, do you have your menu and recipe ready with all the ingredients in the fridge and possibly even prepped? Or do you stop at the grocery store at the last second, see what looks good, and then bring it home? When you're working on a story, can you jump anywhere, jumping from scene to scene to scene? Or do you start at the beginning and have to go to the end? And when writing, do you have to see what you're writing before it makes sense, as in it's down on paper? Or do you hear everything and you write in your head first? That's uh, Beethoven, the composer. Well, it had to see everything what he was writing. And it was really a good thing for him when he went deaf. On the other hand, he had Mozart who had to hear everything in his um, head first, but his manuscripts were pristine. Beethoven's manuscripts were scribbled out all over the place because Beethoven had to see the notes on the page before he could make sense of it, whereas Mozart heard it and then just wrote it down. So again, we're going to be somewhere in between this, but that's exactly part of the process. And knowing how it works. When you sit down to write, does your desk look like this or this? Mine tends to look like that, especially when I'm really going. When you sit down to write, are you thinking about how many words I'm gonna crank out and how I'm gonna to write to this point in the chapter and I point my plot and, oh boy, I can't wait to see where my story is gonna to go today. Keep in mind, most of us are somewhere between these two extremes, okay? And that's the next thing. If you've got most of yours on the left side, you're a plotter. You need to have everything plotted out nice and neatly, organized in a timeline. And that's a good thing. That can be a very good thing. If you're on the right side, you're what's called a pantser, as in you write by the seat of your pants. This is a reference to the early days of aviation when they didn't have a lot of, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, uh, instruments in their planes. So you had to just kind of fly, to hopefully get it right by the seat of your pants. All right. Both of these, and I want to emphasize this a thousand times over, if you get nothing else out of this talk, get this part. Both styles have their pros and their cons. Okay. I remember Stephen King is one of those people who does like intense character studies of every character. I mean, if there's a bank teller in the background, he's got a life story for that person. This is what has been told to me. I don't know if this is actually true. On the other hand, another author, Tony Hillerman, uh, who wrote several Native American based stories, uh, was a total pantser. In fact, I remember I went to a conference years and years ago and when Hillerman was still alive. And he says he was given the topic of outlining going, I don't know why I don't outline. <laughs> he just wrote everything. And he told this funny story about how he was napping one day and he's thinking about his story. And all of a sudden this dog appears in the back seat of a car and he writes it in, but he eventually had to write it out because it had no sense at all. It made no sense at all. Now, if you are a plotter, there are some very good reasons to be a plotter. The pros, of course, are everything in your story is going to hold together. You know, you know where it's going from scene to scene to scene. Everything's there. Boom. And it's great if you're one of those people who has to squeeze your writing into short bursts, like you've got an hour a day 
And that's it to write. Being a plotter is great because you know exactly what that next scene is going to be. And all you have to do is sit down and write it. The cons to being a plotter, though, is sometimes you can spend so much time planning, you never actually write. And I've met several people who get caught in that trap. And it's, it, it is a real problem. Also, you can get boxed in on your plot or characters. Now, I tend to write mysteries, and because I am a mystery writer, uh, I do come from that frame of restaurants, and a lot of the writers I know personally are um, mystery writers. And there's one, a, a lovely woman named Katrina McPherson, lovely Scots lady uh, who lives here in LA. And no, she lives actually in Northern uh, California, excuse me. But she says she doesn't like doing character maps of all her characters because she can get boxed in. And when the character suddenly just starts to develop and it wasn't the way you originally thought, she kind of gets screwed up, it gets screwed up. So that is one of the cons of being a plotter. If your plot is going to go in a more interesting direction, if you just let it go, but you've got it all boxed in this way, you kind of miss out on that. Now, if you're a pantser, there's a big pro, pro in that you start writing. Most pantsers have no problems getting started writing. They just get in there, tap, 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 or scribble, scribble, scribble. And truth be told, the more intuitive process can take you some very, very interesting places. Um, you know, you don't know where it's going to go, and it sure enough inch ends up someplace you would never have thought that, boy, that is a damn good place to go. You also end up with a higher word count. So you can crank out a lot more with a more intuitive pantser type process. The problem is the big con is you're going to have to do a lot of rewriting. Your story is going to be all over the fluffing place and you're going to have to figure out which, and it can also be hard to pick up and drop too. If you're, you're, you're really dependent on just having that moment of inspiration and everything, and you've got an hour a day to write, you can have a problem. Now I am going to stop share and see if we have any questions. Does anybody have any questions? Please raise a hand. Um, Add it in the chat, what have you. Uh, Henry, does, no, that's just you being thoughtful. <laughs> yes, I can see that. Uh, anybody have any questions? Do I edit as I write? Thank you, Rachel. Yes and no. Uh, personally, uh, my process, usually when I come to, uh, come to sit down to write, unless I'm starting at, you know, the beginning, uh, I will read over the previous day's writing and I will add little edits, but I don't usually do serious edits until I'm really at the end. Um, but I do write little edits uh, because, you know, if there's a word missing or something like that, hey, it takes two seconds to fix. What the hell? Um, if I'm writing, when I'm writing, writing, and depending on how intensely I'm involved, you know, it's kind of a mess. <laughs> I have to be honest, it is a little bit of a mess. Um, yes, I do have an editor. Uh, Rachel is asking, do I have an editor as well? Of course I have an editor. You have to have an editor. Uh, it's it's absolutely necessary. Um, my She's a very good friend of mine. And, and oh, God, she makes me crazy. She really does. I love Carol. She is the most intelligent, amazing woman. But she catches stuff. And... There are moments when I just want to kill her. Um, what do I do about writer's block? Uh, lots of different things. Um, what I will generally do is walk. Walking is good. And yeah, I, Henry, do what if I prefer to talk things out? My poor husband. That's all I have to say. <laughs> he has to listen a lot <laughs> to me go on and on and on. And if the door were open to the living room right now, he'd be in here kibitzing. I swear to God, <laughs> he would. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your poor wife. It, it's, and it's really not a bad thing. But yeah, it is one of those things where you have to talk it out. And because I'm audio too, I, I have to hear the scene. I have to hear. And it is actually a problem for me because sometimes it's hard for me to write visually. So... 
Uh, yeah, neither is my husband. He's just a historian, which kind of helps in some play, ways. But yeah, your wife's not a writer. But you know what? Sometimes that's the best thing, Henry. And I'll tell you why. Because you're not writing for other writers. You're writing for readers. And if your wife is a reader, which I'm reasonably certain she is, she married you. Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> what do I know? But the bottom line is you're writing for other readers. And so she doesn't understand the process per se. That's maybe not such a bad thing. But if she understands that, hey, this is how my husband gets through this particular problem. And she's at all supportive, which fortunately, God, thank God my husband is. Then, you know, she'll get there. She'll understand. I mean, you know, there are times when my husband literally will tell me, honey, uh -uh, can't do this right now. I've got other things I've got to think about. I don't want to hear you've only been going on and on and on and on and on and on and on about this particular plot point for the last five weeks. I'm tired of it. <laughs> and he will get into those phases. And, you know, it's not because, you know, he's a bad person or he doesn't love me or anything like that. He's just only heard it 12,000 times and he's getting... You were right the first time, honey, come on, <laughs> you know, or whatever. So it's a different issue. And I do talk it out. But the other thing I like to do when I have writer's block is walk. Now, keep in mind, Jack, um, I do come from a journalism background. And I don't get writer's block very often because I come from a background where that page has to be filled and it has to be filled by this time today. So you write, period. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. When I'm having problems with the story, and I am, there is a story I'm working on right now that I was having a lot of trouble with. And walking does help that. But yeah, I eventually will find it. And I know I've written enough by now to know that I will eventually find it. And you have to be confident that it will come. And that's a little scary when you're a beginning writer. So, all right. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. All righty. Let's go share our screen again. Let's see which, ah, oh, there it is. Now I'm going to be flipping between a lot of different screens periodically because especially when we get into the tools portion of this because I've got several screens on my computer right now. All right. Here's an important thing to understand. You are not going to change your basic tendency. If you are ordered plotting, I'm sorry, pantsing it is only going to make you nuts and you will never get anything written. If you are a pantser and you try to add timelines, character arts, storyboards, you're going to get bored silly and never write the damn story. 90% of the time, and I mean, that's 90% of the time, if you are struggling, it's because you're trying to write against your personal style. So be aware of that. If you're having a real problem, 90% of the time. Now, you'll notice I said 90, not 100. Because but, 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 thank you, Ian Fleming and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Sometimes when you're really stuck, the best thing you can do is work against your tendency. If you are losing your mind because this darn story isn't going where it needs to go, what you may need to do is just sit down and write it. And I've had that happen to me. If you are, say you're a pantser and you feel like your story, you're drowning in the story, you don't know where it's going and everything, you may have to try and be a little more ordered in your st style. Sometimes. It's not always the best thing you can do, but sometimes it can work. Now, here's what a good outline, an outline that works for you, a good outline is one that works for you. It's not necessarily one that works for me. It's not necessarily one that works for Angelina or Maria or Henry or Jack or Rachel. A good outline is one that works for you specifically. 
It can help you write the next scene when you have to pick up and drop or you can't wait for inspiration. You've got a deadline or it's just, I've got one hour a day to write and that's it. Dang it, I'm going to write. It can help you fix your plot holes before you happen. And believe me, plot holes happen. They are no fun. I was, uh, some of my earlier uh, novels I put on my blog as a serial, uh, as a fiction serial. And one of those novels was A Nose for a Needleman. And I'm like, that last week before I was going to post it, and I had announced it. So I had to post it on time because people knew it was coming. And this darn book, I'm reading through that last final, uh, you know, look at it and went, there's a plot hole here. It's a massive plot hole the size of Calcutta. No! And I had to fix it in the first scene. If I had a good outline when I'd written the darn thing, that would have never happened. But I did fix it and I did have a gift of somebody going, no, for a couple of weeks up on the blog. But, you know, life happens. But I did fix it. But and a good outline prevents that sort of thing from happening. So th th there is a good place for that. It can help you build your characters. I had an outline. Uh, in fact, it was Death of the Chinese Field Hands, which is the second in the old Los Angeles series. Um, and the bad guy, I had the scene that I knew was the right scene. This was a great scene. The bad guy had my character, Maddie Wilcox. He pulled her up, put the knife to her throat and said, stop investigating. And I'm sitting here going, wait a minute. This guy is a cold blooded killer. Why doesn't he just waste her? This doesn't make sense. Bing, 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 bing. And I'm writing my outline. He doesn't want to kill her. So the outline helps you build your characters because you're outlining, hey, this is what needs to happen. And then you're say, looking at this and saying, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. But if the character is doing this, it does make sense. And that's exactly what happened. I have a character who does not want to kill anybody anymore. I will, and, and it is a line and, and, and it became, I will kill you. I have to, I want a home. I will not let, I have finally found a home. I will not let you take that away from me. Became the, uh, uh, the shout out line for the book. So it can help you build your characters. A good plot line can, uh, outline can help you do that. Can also help you keep you right you from writing yourself into a corner. There is a series by an author whom I like very much, Elaine Vietz, called the Dead End Job series. And this woman wrote herself into a corner. And what that means is you've got a plot line that's not going to make sense unless somebody does something that's going to really mess up your series. Um, how many of you guys remember the West Wing? Anybody? Yeah. Remember when Aaron Sorkin, the guy who created the West Wing, made President Bartlett have a, a multiple sclerosis? That is writing yourself into a corner with a hey, nami and a hot cha-cha. It's one of those things where he really had to do some scrambling to make that storyline work out. And if you've got a good outline, that's what's going to prevent that, okay? Now, keep in mind, this is coming from the perspective that I am a mystery writer, so clues and red herrings are absolutely critical. But if you really want to learn how to plot a novel, trust me, learn how to write a whodunit. Because everything at the beginning has to line up at the end. And a good outline can make sure that everything at the beginning lines up at the end. If you've got a uh, an event that you know happens in chapter three that really reflects on something else that's going to happen in chapter 12 a good outline will make sure that that's there all right this is going to stop screen share and do we have any more commercials at commercials questions anybody okay give it a minute 
take some water. No questions? Yes, do I prefer writing with pen? Uh, actually, I did a lot of my early writing with pen and paper. In fact, I've got a whole bunch of uh, manuscripts that we just found in the attic that the rats have snacked on. But um, actually nowadays, and, and I've been doing this since fairly early on, uh, I, but I did learn to compose at the keyboard. Um, when I first started writing, it was typewriter <laughs> and, that would, and you have to retype everything. And Oh my God, that was hell. But I got into uh, word processing in the mid eighties. And uh, after a, a fair, you know, after I did my master's first master's thesis, I pretty much composed on the keyboard. It was just so much easier and so much easier to change things when you screw something up. On the other hand, there is uh, a lot of um, a lot to be said for the visceral experience of handwriting. Uh, will you be able to give it a copy of the PowerPoint? Of course, Maria. Uh, Rachel, you and Jack will see to that particular part of the process, or do you need me to put it out? And, oh, and they are recording the video. So please, uh, you know, you'll get to look at it again. But yeah, uh, I will send a link. Uh, I will actually, Rachel, I've already sent you the PowerPoint. So you and you and Jack can uh, email it to anybody who wants it. All right. If you've lost it, just email me again. It's not that hard to click. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to go back. Any more questions? Going once, twice. All right. We'll go back and share our screen again. All righty. Now, there are four basic ways to outline. And keep in mind, this is the style of outlining. It's not whether you're doing it digitally or manually. You can do it any way you want. All of these you can do digitally or manually. Uh, each will fall into one of three categories for you guys. The first one will be, oh, perfect. I want to use this. Oh, my God. I am saved. The other one will eh, might work. And then, of course, only if I'm desperate. Now, which one you will use will be more determined by your personal style. But also keep in mind, it will also be determined by the, st uh, the story you're telling. And believe me, I've used different types of outlining for different types of stories. So it, it, it will vary. And there's nothing wrong with that. By the way, there are tons, and I mean tons, of templates available for every style of outlining. Uh, you just have to do a Google. It's no big deal. You will probably gravi naturally gravitate towards the styles that work best for you. And believe me, if it feels right, it's going down, you're writing, it's right. Don't even worry about it. Don't worry about what anybody else says about it. It's right for you, okay? And, and again, I cannot stress that enough. This is the traditional thesis to conclusion. We learned this one in high school, possibly, certainly in college. You put your thesis statement up or, you know, your first scene. And then we your supporting points and then the supporting sub points and then the supporting sub, sub, sub points and all that. I got this particular how to write an outline from uh, University at Albany. And it's a very good, I use it actually when I'm uh, writing nonfiction. It's very good for nonfiction. But it can also be used for fiction. There's no reason you can't put, okay, this is my first scene. This is what has to happen in that first scene. These are the characters who have to be in this first scene. These are the characters who might be saying something else in that first scene. So there's no reason you can't use it. If it works for you, use it. Now, this is one that tends to confuse people because it's a little weird. It's based on the work of Joseph Campbell. It's called The Character Arc or Hero's Journey. Now, these particular stops on the hero's journey, the ordinary world call to adventure, refusal of the call, yada, yada, those are things that are going to happen um, uh, very, you know, th those are different things that are going to happen. Return with the elixir, resurrection. Those are different stops that may or may not happen in your story. You can put other things in there. Like, um, for example, I had one of my uh, novels, Blood Red, which is the fourth in the Freddie and Kathy uh, 
1920 series. In that case, a lot of what was happening to Freddie, whose father had been murdered, had a lot to do with, okay, Freddie's father's murdered. This is how Freddie reacts. This is how Freddie doesn't react. This is why Freddie's afraid. This is what's also acting on him. And it kind of went back and forth. So it was, this is really good if you're writing really character driven types of uh, work, uh, stories and like that. Uh, it, it, it's a good one. So you don't all have to use these same stops, but the idea is you're kind of creating a circle. Uh, and if that works for you, that works. And, and you know, um, my, these are my favorite, and you can tell they're because they're in my handwriting. You can track events with a calendar or a storyboard and basically saying, okay, this happened here, 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 this happened here. This, happened here. Uh, this is actually from Blood Red, this one. Okay, we have five, the, the uh, Fred Sr.'s funeral. This is how Freddie reacts and recovers from being really drunk at the funeral. And, uh, you know, Fred shot here and then, oh, look, there's air, you know, and you'll, you'll notice I put a lot of arrows because things move. Okay. But it's, it, this is really good. One of the reasons I like using calendars is I can keep track of all the different things that have to happen. For me, the characters, I tend to be very, you know, intuitive when it comes to my characters. They're all talking in my head. It's a very noisy place up there. So... <laughs> That's what these things do. And so for me, this is one of the reasons why it works. Oh, and then I have to work in Palm Sunday and Easter. And Easter in New York involves certain things. And this is taking place in New York in the 1920s. So I need to make sure that this is consistent with that. So having an event works. And then, of course, there's the story structure style. Now, you use these a lot with the old Los Angeles series. And... You can use one act, you can use two act, three act, four act. I like four act. One of the reasons I like a four act story structure is it's insanely familiar. Why? Because that's how TV shows are laid out. You have your little intro. We have our 15 minutes to the first, uh, uh, you know, first commercial. When we find out we have a problem, we have the 30 minutes where the problems really kind of come apart at the seams. Uh, the next 15 minutes where we think everything's going to come out okay, but then it goes to hell. And then act four where everything's wrapped up and sewn up. So four act story structure is really very useful. And again, it's very, very familiar. And this is exactly how I used it, more or less. I kind of fudged a couple of things in act one. But this is how I used it for Death of the City Marshal. You know, I tend to write the finale at the end of the act. You don't have to, you can just kind of work your way up to it. But I tend to write, okay, what needs to happen at the end of the act one? Oh, Maddie needs to find the body. Or in Death of the Chinese Field Hand, oh, she needs to have the second field hand killed. What needs to happen first? Well, she needs to meet up with James, James and she needs to find that all important straight piece of paper. Again, this is very good if you're building red herrings and clues into your manuscript. And again, that's my background. So uh, finale, act two, bad guy attacks Maddie, which was the scene I was describing earlier. Well, what also needs to happen before that? Well, we need to have our day at the races. They need to talk to Ms. Ernesto and we have to visit with Mrs. Sutton. Keep in mind, there are like about 12 or 15 different things that usually show up in this list. Um, some of them are character driven, some are a lot. And Act Three, Maddie's house burns down. What needs to happen first? Oh well, we need to have the meet up with this character and that character. And uh, oh, the bad guy gets caught. Well, what needs to happen first? Oh, they need to figure out that he is the bad guy. Yada yada. Um, interestingly enough, in Time Enough, which is a novel that I will eventually be blogging probably in the next year or so, I use three different four act story structures for each of the three different parts of the book each book each little act in the three you know act in the book three act book had four acts in it so it's, yeah. it, it can you know so you can use it more than one way you don't have to just do this particular thing okay and all right let's before we go into tools Let's stop the share. Do we have any questions? Ah, ha, ha. 
How's a novel different from writing a short story? It's longer, for one thing. Uh, you can use the same four act story structure. Um, I'm not as prone to. I think of. I, I tend to think of a uh, a uh, short story as a one act play as opposed to a four act play. And there really isn't much difference between a four act and a three act. It's just you know how many acts. How how do you divide the story up? If it works better for you to have three acts, kind of like in Time Enough, there were three sections. It's a time travel novel. So the first section was in the modern time. The, section ta uh, uh, the second section happened in a future time. And the third section happened in the way past. So it's, uh, it, you know, it, it depends on what works for the story. And you know what, it's gonna work. It's gonna change with the story. That's the other thing that's kind of fun about this is it depends on the story. Um, Angelina wanted to know how much time do I spend on an outline? Well, that depends. <laughs> uh, the project I'm working on right now, I have been working on the outline for two, three weeks now. Uh, sometimes I will spend months. Uh, I've got another project that I quote unquote should be working on uh, that I have a fourth act that is like really bare of events. That I really need to put more time in on. And uh, so, you know, but I've been working on it for months. So it really depends on the, uh, on the project. I, I, I wish I could be more specific. Uh, how do I, how soon do I start the novel once the outline is done? Uh, actually, I've probably already started it. I, <laughs> my process and now this is what works for me again for me i get about three to four chapters in before i write an outline it's kind of weird i just for some reason i have to get the voices down i have to find out i mean i'll have an idea of who done it because again i write mostly mysteries or where i want to go with it i'll have an idea where the story is going to end before i start writing but yeah, a lot of times I'll write about two or three chapters before I even start outlining. But again, that's what works for me. You may find something totally different. So I don't want, you know, I don't want you guys to feel like, you know, well, she knows everything. No, she doesn't. All right. Any other questions? You know, these are good questions, by the way. I'm really impressed. You guys are great. So, all right. We're going to share the screen again. All righty. Oh yeah, helps to hit the extra button. All right, tools you can use. Now tools are important. These are just things that can be used. Uh, I have non-digital tools. There are times when I scribble things out on paper. In fact, if I stop sharing, I can show you another calendar that I've been scribbling around. I have, uh, where is it? Yeah, notes on little bits of paper, okay? <laughs> This is what I use, and it depends on what the story is doing. So um, I use pen and paper all the time. Note cards, people love note cards. I use scraps of paper. You'll see that's why I have this as my background. I love little scraps of paper. Uh, some people use photos or magazine pictures. Uh, you could probably even put pieces on a chessboard. A lot of people like cork boards or whiteboards um, to, to lay things out. The pros to uh, using non-digital tools, of course, it's faster and it's more visceral. Writing something with your hand is very, very visceral. It's one of the reasons why a lot of people, uh, and I know a very good writer who she writes everything out by hand. And I would, I would never be able to do that because if I have to retype something I've already written, it makes me crazy. The cons are, of course, if you've got 5,000 pieces of paper and calendars and everything, you got, and you want to take it on the road with you, you've got to pack it with you. And sometimes, say, if you've got pieces on a chessboard or your big old cork board, it's not really portable at all. So those are some of the pros and cons. Digital tools. Now, this is where we're going to have fun playing back and forth with the share screen on this, because I can show you some of these things. I've got them already pulled up. Uh, these are digital tools. The pros to digital tools, and I, and I will show you them in a minute. It's very easy to change something when you've decided, oh, wait, that shouldn't have happened that way. They are more or less pot portable. Scrivener and Aeon Timeline, excuse me, tend not to be because they are, um, unfortunately, Scrivener and Aeon Timeline uh, tend to be very Apple-centric. 
And if you're not in the Apple universe, that can be a bit of a problem. But most of these things, Evernote or OneNote, Apple Notes, word processor, they're very, very portable. You can play with this stuff on your phones these days, except for Scrivener and Neon Timeline, depending on the phone you have. The cons, oh my God, does Scrivener have a steep learning curve. Trello is pretty easy. Evernote can be a little weird. Your word processor is easy, um, but it can be, they can be, have rather steep learning curves. And on timeline, I didn't have as much trouble with Scrivener. Sometimes I still can't get my hand around. The other thing is you can really get it hooked into look, everything looking nice and pretty. And I will show you exactly what I mean. I'm going to stop the share screen, start the share screen. Um, let's show you Scrivener. Okay. Oh, wait, we had a question. I'm going to stop share real fast. What is my favorite digital tool? Oh, I haven't met a digital tool I didn't like, dear. I'm, 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 I'm a geek. I have to admit it. I really am. It's kind of sad. But there are, this is the uh, Scrivener uh, binder. This is the left side. This is where all the different elements are. Here's the tab. Uh, here, here's the, um, uh, the texts, the different, the actual text of the, the thing. Uh, here's some character sheets that I did for the different characters so I could keep track of all the suspects. Uh, and here's the outline. Now, here's one thing that you can do with Scrivener. If you can see up here, you can look at it in different ways. You can see it as a whole series of lines. You can see the actual text that's in there. Or you can see it as little note cards. And they are very easy to move around if you want to. And why that's not moving, I don't know. But Scrivener has this, and a lot of people, you can make little color notes on them. These represent different days in the, in the timeline for me. Um, truth be told, I don't like Scrivener's outlining as much as other people do, but there are some other things I can do in here that with Scrivener are really good for me. Where is it hiding? Ah, like keeping track of a character's wardrobe. Uh, Maddie is clothes horse. So keeping track of how many different dresses she has, and it's something that's going to go from store, uh, show, uh, you know, from book to book to book, because, you know, this is 1870. You wore the same clothes all the time. You didn't really have that many different clothes. So I, I, I can keep track of it. Her first uh, or her best, uh, you know, her best writing habit, her second best writing habit, or her third best writing habit. And then I can also keep track of characters that recur all the time, like uh, the Rancho staff, Hernan Mendoza, Maria Mendoza, uh, Wang Fu, um, and, uh, you know, some of the ladies of Los Angeles society. You know, this is Mrs. Emily Elmwood, who is the preacher's wife and is really kind of a pain in the butt, truth be told. But Mrs. Judson, Mrs. Glissell, and Mr. Glissell. By the way, Mr. Glissell was a real person, only I fictionalized him. So that's Scrivener. And again, the fun thing about Scrivener, oh my God, it has a steep, steep learning curve. Let's go to my other favorite. Ah, Aeon Timeline. This one I'm really getting excited about. This is for the, uh, this is the outline for, uh, actually it's a whole series that I'm working on called Operation Quickline. And uh, you can see that I've been working on this all the way. You know, some of these are uh, lightened out because they completed. I'm going to uncheck that so you can see this. But I can get a range of the dates that this happened. In this particular case, this particular character arc, she started failing here and ends up there. Uh, this particular event, she goes out on a pickup. And then these are all the different things that happened on it. Lisa goes to pick up the process. Oh, did I? Can you guys see the Aeon timeline? I want to make yes, sure. You, yeah. All right. And then all the different things that happens, like Lisa's having a nightmare. This is from the uh, the, uh, the other book. Um, in this particular story from this day forward, by the way, this book is actually from just because you're paranoid. These things in yellow, these are all events that she relates on this day. 
the when you know uh, uh no no this day here because it's you know in this particular series is it's a series of journals every title isn't chapter one it's this date this date this date and all these things come up in this chapter here but then we start going back to a normal uh, chapter structure and oh come on and then you'll notice this one takes several days because oh my god we've got several things going on over the next several days uh you, the nice thing about Aeon Timeline that I don't use, but I can, is you can add character arcs, you can add character birthdays, so you can keep track of recurring characters. And in this particular series, there's a lot of kids. And because it's happening in real time in the 1980s, I want to make sure those kids are turning 8, 9, 10, 12 at the right times. So you can do stuff like that. And so this is Aeon Timeline, and it is, uh, it's as close to my favorite <laughs> as I've got right now. Uh, let's see, uh, as, as far as digital tools are concerned. Um, and let me share my screen. Uh, Aeon Timeline, let me write that out. A-E-O-N. I'm gonna put this in the chat. And it's really fun. Again, the big problem with Scrivener and Aeon Timeline is that they both tend to be very Mac and Apple centric. Ah, Evernote. Evernote has saved my backside. It is my filing system. Everything lands in here. Uh, Rapid change, you know, an article I read on rapid change in 1920s fashion, and this is from the fascinating rhythm one. Um, yeah, let's see what's going on in Fugue and Minor Key. No, that wasn't that much. Uh, I mean, I've got all sorts of stuff in here. Uh, no, that wasn't it. Oh, let me go to one of the... Look at all the stuff I pulled up on. You know, I've got my notes, that my handwritten notes. You can put those in there. The synopsis. Oh yeah, there's an article on American nurses in World War One that actually ha plays into what happens. Um, you know, notes on things. I want to make sure I get changed. Oh, what do guys do on a ranch here? You know, all sorts of historical data and stuff like that. And the nice thing about all about mole. She were they making mole in 1870 Los Angeles? Um. Victorian purses. This so basically, this is all stuff I've gotten off the internet. And the nice thing about Evernote, let's see. I'm going to stop sharing and show you something on one of my other screens. Where is it? Yeah, I'm going to put this one up. It's actually uh, this is my uh, uh, browser window, but you can see this little window here. I can click on that. And it will automatically make a note out of Zoom 5.0 being here, which I don't want, so we're not going to do that. But um, that you can, you it, this I have the Chrome browser, but the Evernote thing is available, I think, for Edge. Pretty sure for Edge, uh, but Firefox for sure. So that's one of those things you can really use Evernote. It makes it insanely useful when you're doing that last bit of. Gee, did they really say that in 1870? Kind of research. Uh, da, 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 da. Did Scribner did that? Did that? Okay, so those are the those are some of the digital things. I mean, I think you guys know what. Truth be told, I think you all know what a uh, word file looks like. Evernote, OneNote. OneNote is the same thing basically as Evernote. It's just Microsoft's uh, project. Oh, 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 oh. One other one. I'm sorry. I have to stop share and share screen. Let me go back to my browser. And ah, Trello. This is a web app. This thing is enormously useful. Now, this is how I produce the book. This is for these hallowed halls. That's the blog that's going to be going up. 
So there are different things, the creation phase, the book production phase, the launch phase, my marketing plan template, which I don't use nearly as much. But because you can create lists and then these little cards that you move all over the place, um, what you can do is, okay, this is this date in the story. This is act, or act one, act two, act three, act four. You can do a list of that way. You can do character profiles. This is Maddie, this is uh, Ernesto, this is Mrs. Sutton, this is so-and-so. You can do all these different things. You can move things around. Em Truth be told, Trello is enormously useful for organizing anything, <laughs> not just books, it, it, it really is. Um, and then my other favorite little one, this is Keep. Uh, there's a... Uh, I'll have to go back to the card, uh, but there are uh, similar, they're basically light little notes. And so if I'm walking around and, oh yeah, look, there's a, something I wanna do with a future Los An old Los Angeles book, Lomax testifying, you know, and, and that. So if I'm walking around, I'll write these little net, uh, you know, I'll write these little notes and just put them in here and they go in with everything else I'm doing, like a Southside cocktail or you know, something. Okay. And there you go. Do Zendo, some other things I need to do. So keep is very, very useful and very, very easy to use. So, and but there's another uh, Microsoft version of it. I forget what it is. And I will know it about, yeah, Apple Notes. Excuse me, it wasn't Microsoft, it's Apple. Word processor, Google Docs, Word, Apple Writer, you know what those things are. You can use that. And those are very easy to mess around with. Pinterest, I don't like as much, but I don't tend to be as visual. So that can be another digital tool you can use. Though, if you want to get pictures, you know, especially since I read a lot of historical fiction, Pinterest is really good for putting up lots of different pictures of, oh, I don't know what people wore in the 1870s, what people wore in uh, the 1920s. So those are good. All right. Let's stop share. See if there's any other questions. I want to make sure everybody gets their answers. Okie dokie. And we don't have a lot left, so we'll go right into it then. Going once, twice. All right, let's go back. So when do you outline, which was an earlier question. <laughs> Thank you, Angelina. You need it basically that when you start outlining is when you need to know what comes next. That's why I usually get about two or three chapters in because I don't need to know what comes next until then. For some people, you need to outline before you write your first word. Jeffrey Deaver is notorious for this. He's got every freaking beat laid out. And I'm like going, why aren't you just writing the damn novel for Christ's sakes? But for him, it works. Fine. Uh, for some, an outline maybe the second part of the second or third draft. You know, get that far into the process and you're still coming out. <coughs> For this one thing I've been working on from this day forward, I've been having a real problem, having been able to write because I didn't know where I was going. And I couldn't get the outline down because I didn't know where everything was going to end up. And I finally figured it out this morning. Yay! I was excited. <laughs> That's why I walk a lot. Okay. But it's as important to know not just when to outline, but the other important thing is when not to outline because sometimes that's what you don't want to be doing. And you want to not outline when you're not writing. Okay. You know, uh, my kid is notorious for this. She is a world builder. She one, writes up these wonderful fantasy worlds and then never writes a story. I met another lady who just has every beat written out and then never writes the story. And I'm going, no. If you're not writing, get away from the right outline, okay? Uh, I got stuck with uh, time enough because I was writing the future world and I had to do a lot of world building. One has to do that. 
but unfortunately I wasn't writing the story and it took forever to get it done as a result. So <clears throat> that's my piece. Shall we have some more questions? And I will have a sip of wine while you make up your mind. Anybody? Okay. Ah, well, thank you, Jack. That was sweet of you. <laughs> Hope everybody else felt helpful and got something out of it. Um, you can always contact me at annelouisebannon.com. I will put that in here. One. If you do want to buy my books, which, you know, frankly, guys, I, I, I do try to make a living at this. Um, please feel free to, to uh, uh, check out my uh, sign. Well, I'm glad. Well, thank you, Maria. That's so sweet of you. And um, please feel free to contact me through the website. Oh, dear God, I messed that up. But it's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash. And please keep in mind, Anne has the E on the end, which a lot of people don't get. So it kind of messes things up. Any other questions? Ah, you got somebody shooting out fireworks outside. <laughs> I'll send your um, links in the email that I send out for the PowerPoint too, just in case they missed them in the chat. Oh, please do. That would and be like lovely. Jack said the, uh, the recording will, will be available at the end of the week on our website. So if anyone missed it or want to pass it on to anyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And please, hey, Rachel, would you let me know when it's up so that I can uh, put it in my social media as well? Of course. And thank uh, you so much. This was really great. Thank you for answering all the questions. And this was a great PowerPoint. More than happy. And like I said, please feel free to contact me if you have any, any additional ones, because, you know, this is one of those things that, it's really easy when you're first starting out as a writer to get really neurotic about it. You know, I suck, I don't do it. And, and the reality is the more you write, the more you feel confident about what you're writing. And ultimately it's learning to find that space in your soul, in your head that says, hey, I can do this. And again, your stories count. We need to hear them. You're all important. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, no, these books are already written. Uh, I, I, I've been tempted. I'm coming this close with the, the White House Rhapsody part of the blog. But uh, no, I generally prefer to have the book written because I don't want to have to postpone writing a post, posting something because I still haven't gotten the darn thing written. So <laughs> these things All happen. Right. All right. Thank you again. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate it. Great questions, by the way. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, bye-bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Bye.